Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Physical Security University. My name is Guy Reams, and today's class is PSU 305, Power Considerations for Physical Security. Uh, I have today a couple of moderators on with me. I think I have Ann, and I also have Fred, so thank you for joining as well. And uh, I would just like to do a quick audio check if uh, one of my moderators could chat to me if uh, if they hear me okay, uh, am I coming through loud and clear? Or maybe anybody can tell me. <laughs> so we have the chat window available for you where you can provide me responses. And uh, I just got a response from somebody saying that my audio is good. So thank you very much for helping me out on that. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. This session is being recorded. And shortly after the course, I will be posting the recorded archive on physicalsecurityu.com. And in addition to that, various other materials that I'm going over in class today will also be posted on that website. We also have a special offer today for MicroSemi. After the course is over and you get the email invitation to the online course, if you go and participate in the online course and you take a small little examination I have on Power Briefnet, don't worry. Uh, you can keep taking it until you finally pass it. Uh, the uh, POE exam, if you pass it, the first 20 people to pass that exam will get a free Power Over Ether test, Power Over Ethernet testing unit uh, that we will ship to you if you successfully complete that exam. Uh, that's, that is offers available to the first 20 people to complete. Uh, you'll be seeing that product that you will get free today uh, as we work in the class. Uh, just a couple of, couple of uh, points before we begin. Uh, the site that we, I have all my content on is physicalsecurityu.com. And if you don't have an account already, then my team will create an account for you shortly after this course. And you will be then given access to the PSU 305 course. And you'll be able to participate, look at the archive and any other content I have there. If you see any other courses on physicalsecurity.com that you would like to, uh, to take a look at, then click the register button, that you, the register link to you there, and, and, and opt in to one of the courses. And shortly thereafter, uh, the team here will, will uh, add you to the course, and you'll be able to see previous courses that we've done in the archives there, there those archives. You can also go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash user slash Guy Reigns, and you can check out any videos that I've posted recently. And there you go. So today we're going to be uh, talking about one of my favorite topics. Uh, a lot of people consider it kind of boring, but uh, to be honest with you, physical security cameras and uh, security products would not be successful if we were not able to power them. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to be stalling just a little bit because some attendees might have uh, thought that the class started at 1030 due to a calendar issue. So uh, um, I'm going to take care of some preliminary stuff, and then we'll get into more of the meat of the discussion at 10.30. Let's go ahead, and uh, uh, I have a poll question that I'm going to put out there to the audience. So uh, uh, go ahead and watch your screens. You'll be getting a, a poll question. All right, so you have about five minutes to respond to this poll. So uh, the poll went out. Uh, go ahead and take a look at that and respond to my uh, my four poll questions. Some of them are just fun. It's kind of nice to know where people are at and what their experience level is before I begin talking about the course content. Very good. I see that most of you are responding. That's good. All right. While you're doing, while you're finishing up that poll, uh, we're going to be uh, going over uh, power considerations for physical security projects. While we're doing this, you want to make sure that you can see my video screen. Uh, I have a video screen that you should be able to see. You should see me talking right now. In in, in a few minutes, that screen will not just show me. It'll also show other things. Like, and I'll just do a real quick tour to make sure that you can see it. Um, I'm going to be showing, um, let me show you. We have a variety of screen views that we're going to see. Uh, here's one of them. 
This is the table in which I have a variety of physical security products laid out. So hopefully you're able to see that. I will now show you the, uh, the server room. We're going to be taking a look at uh, some products in my server room. So I will, uh, maybe I'll get this right. Sometimes I mess it up, but we'll see. Oh, nope, got that one wrong. All right, well, don't worry about the server room. I'll show you that one in a minute. Uh, anyway, there's a couple of cameras, uh, different camera angles. This one is kind of a bird's eye view of the lab. So uh, we'll have a, a couple of different camera angles coming at you here in a minute. But for now, we'll go ahead and just focus on what I have to say. And then in a minute, we'll take a look at some more products. So make sure you're able to see the video. Looks like most of you are finishing the poll question. All right, thank you much. Looks like we have a little bit of a mix of different people that are on here. And, uh, oh, nobody answered, uh, I love Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, certainly I would attract at least one person to click on that. All right, so uh, anyway, thank you for uh, answering the poll question. For those of you who haven't finished, there's a few more minutes left on that, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to be uh, covering a variety of topics. So let me go ahead and share, and we'll just make sure this works. You should at this point be seeing uh, my, uh, you should be able to see the uh, PowerPoint presentation I have open right now. I've kept the PowerPoint at a minimal resolution. The, the reason is, is because I want the resolution to uh, fit most monitors, so you should be able to see that. Um, now, just as, a, as, as a, a preliminary item, as I'm discussing the topics today, Feel free to chat, um, ask me questions. Uh, if you're brave enough, you're welcome to interrupt me and speak over the conference call. Uh, Mo, I've muted you by default, so if you do want to speak over the conference call, you'll have to unmute yourself and say something. Sometimes that doesn't work out so well if you don't have a good connection. But if you have a good connection and you feel confident you've done WebEx before, feel free to ask a question. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can post it in the chat session. And uh, I will see the question. Uh, one of my moderators will also see the question. And we'll be able to respond to your question as we go. I really prefer you ask questions. Even though I've got a set agenda, I have no problem deviating and going down to whatever topic uh, that interests you. So no problem on that. I'd love to be able to do that. First off, let's go. I'd like to say a special thank you to Minuteman. Uh, Minuteman is a UPS manufacturer. They also manufacture a variety of other power components. Minuteman was gracious enough to donate equipment to today's discussion so I can show you some actual product today that uh, does the features that I'm interested in showing you. I'd also like to thank MicroSemi, who is the one sponsoring the giveaway that we have today. In addition, MicroSemi uh, owns the company Power Design, and they have a variety of power over Ethernet products that I'll be demonstrating today. And so all those products we'll be showing today come from either Minuteman or Power Design, and I'm grateful that they've donated their equipment for today's lab experience. So uh, I'd like to thank them and, and uh, appreciate uh, their participation in this course. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first topic is we're going to talk about UPS power systems. Now, uh, most everybody understands that you have to have a UPS nowadays to protect your equipment. Uh, a UPS, but most people think UPS just in terms of power failure. So if there's a power failure, power failure, I need to have a UPS. Well, in physical security, it's even more important to have a UPS because there's things that happen outdoors or things that happen within a building that could cause significant damage to our equipment. So there are five major areas that we need to, a UPS to protect us from. The first is a voltage spike. So let's say there's a lightning hit outside or something happens within the building, a generator turns on, whatever the case may be, and there's a sustained voltage overload on the electrical circuit we have our equipment plugged into. It could be an extremely expensive thing to have to replace cameras, replace equipment, DVR, server products, 
if a voltage spike caused damage to our equipment. On security equipment, uh, the, the equipment sometimes can be extremely sensitive. And so uh, a voltage spike can damage equipment, whereas a PC may be able to survive it, or maybe the, just the power supply would blow. Uh, in a physical security product, you can't easily replace the power supply, and so you basically will destroy the device and have to replace. You also have momentary reductions in input voltage. Uh, as you well know, most PCs and servers have capacitor, uh, capacitor capability of handling a few milliseconds of delay in power. Physical security products are not the case. Uh, most of them have zero tolerance for uh, input shortage, and consequently, it's very important to regulate the power. This is why a lot of physical security devices have DC power connections. You convert the AC to a DC power source, and then you supply the power to the device, and the reason is is because the device requires a steady stream of power with no fluctuations. Well, if the power AC power quits to the uh, power supply that's converting to DC power, you may have that same interruption of power. So we commonly plug these devices into UPSs or some type of protective power to avoid momentary reductions in input voltage. In input voltage. Uh, noise introduced by high frequencies. Uh, unfortunately, physical security is never put in a pristine environment. It's always put in warehouses or buildings or outdoor environments, near generating equipment, sometimes in uh, uh, supply yards uh, or different places where there may be a, a lot of high frequency that could potentially uh, get on top of our power cable and cause us interruption. So additional noise caused by uh, other sources could impact the quality or the ability of our devices to work. This definitely impacts video. If you have a video uh, a camera that is displaying an image, you've got uh, extra noise on that power, uh, which will definitely impact the video quality of your camera device. So uh, being able to regulate and control the power is critical to quality video, but also making sure that your cameras and your video is not disrupted. You also have frequency instability. Um, not all AC power is clean and doesn't always come from a good source. And so uh, we also need to protect from that. And then finally, distortion, uh, caused by a variety of reasons. But these are the five major reasons why we might need a UPS in a physical security environment. Now, UPSs are needed at the head end, where we keep video recorders, where we keep our power supplies but oftentimes are also needed at the edge or at other areas, such as a, monitor, a workstation that we might be monitoring cameras from, or maybe uh, uh, a camera device itself might need a UPS, um, or a variety of other types of aspects of physical security where a UPS may be required. So therefore, we require different types of sizes of UPS in a physical security project. The decision to buy a UPS requires a lot of thinking. Um, it's not always, it's not just go buy a UPS. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna narrow you down to two UPSs that I, that were the most common on physical security projects that I did. So when I do physical security projects, I usually fall into two camps when it comes to UPS products, and I'm gonna show you those two. Uh, those are the two I'm gonna focus on. But let's just quickly go through some of the decision-making factors that need to be involved with UPS decisions. First off, you have to decide on the type of UPS. Do you need a line interactive or an offline or standby UPS? You can also get into online double conversion or modular UPSs. Mostly online or double conversion or modular UPSs are too high end for us to worry about physical security. So really it's a decision between line interactive and standby UPSs. Basically what this means is a standby UPS effectively says that while the battery is fully charged, the AC is going to go direct from the input to the output. So you'll be getting direct AC power right from the line with no interruption. Why it says standby or offline is if you do have a power lapse or a momentary loss of power, there is a few milliseconds of delay while the UPS shifts over to battery. That can be up to 15 milliseconds on some standby UPSs. 
this may be too sensitive for some physical security equipment. So you need to be very clear when you buy UPS that if you're buying a standby UPS and saving a few bucks, that your UPS will, that your device, your power will handle it. For example, I have some power supplies up here behind me that we'll be looking at later. We have power supplies that will not handle a 10 millisecond delay and loss of power. Therefore, a standby UPS just will not work. Some devices, such as a uh, small little uh, NVR box like you see right here, that I have one here from Western Digital and one from Bosch, both of these require uh, a UPS, but both of them will sustain a momentary loss. They can handle up to 20 milliseconds in loss of power. Therefore, a standby, standby UPS would work no problem for these guys. So it depends on your equipment, and you need to evaluate that. The other types of UPSs are line interactive, which means there's very little interruption when there's a loss of power, which means the power comes in, it feeds the battery, and the battery is converted then back to AC, back to the device. So there's a constant flow of power, even if there's an interruption. So uh, those are your two different types of UPSs. Obviously, offline and standby UPSs are much cheaper. The second thing we need to consider is uh, input voltage. Um, are, is it a 220 situation or a 120 volt situation? That's pretty easy. The next thing to understand is the connection. Now, I'm going to flip my video to show you a very, very common problem you have to deal with. So let me um, uh, let me do this if I can figure it out. There we go. Actually, I got a better way to do it. Hold on. I got all excited, but let me show you a different way of doing it. Um, I'm going to share my um, browser. And we're going to go live in the server room. Okay, so we're looking at the server room right now. So I'm going to walk in there, and I'm going to show you a common problem that oftentimes happens on UPS devices. So I'm walking in there right now. So just give me a minute. Hope uh, you should be able to see my screen where you can see the server room. There, as you can see there, I was holding up. I was holding up a UPS, my UPS device has a, a twist and lock connector. It's 110 30 amp plug over the twist lock connector. Um, and, and there's a NEMA rating for that, but I won't, we don't need to bother with that right now. But you need to pay attention to the fact that different UPS devices will have different plug types. Um, so one of the most, one, a horrible thing that can happen to you is you're ready to start your physical security project. You load up your equipment, you rack and stack it, you're ready to go, and then you unpack the UPS and you got a twist lock plug, but you have a standard NEMA 5 connection. So now you're trying to figure out, okay, now you gotta call an electrician out, or you gotta do it yourself, and you gotta put in a twist lock plug. So most of the time, a 30 amp um, UPS will have a twist lock plug, almost always. But not, not always the case, but in most cases, a UPS required 30 amps will have the twist lock plug. The next thing you have to decide on is um, uh, UPS decision. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint again here. Hold on. Okay. So uh, the next thing is whether or not it's three phase or single phase. In most small office buildings, Class A office space, as well as residential, you'll always have single phase. Uh, and, and the way they, they the single phase, it's got 110 coming through one wire, and then you got a neutral. Uh, but in what they do is they end up connecting two wires to produce 220. Well, three phase actually has multiple wires coming in, and so they can get the 220 uh, a lot easier, and they can provide provide more voltage uh, in an easier configuration. Most commercial buildings will have the option of three phase. So you gotta be careful when buying a UPS. If you buy a single phase UPS, 
it will not work with a three-phase outlet. Um, if you have a three-phase UPS, uh, three-phase is backwards compatible with single-phase. So you just got to be pay attention to that issue. Um, always consult the electrician on what plug type and size and what phase and what uh, amp amps the uh, incoming uh, connection is before you try to uh, set up a UPS. Um, I can tell you a few horror stories when I first started out with this problem, but I won't, we won't get into that right now. So uh, the next thing you have to understand is how many uh, VA or KVA the UPS supports. So how much load is your UPS going to be under? So you have two issues. You have load and you have capacity. Load is how much sustained voltage that, that UPS will output. Obviously, you need to add up all of your devices, both on boot up of those devices and once those devices are running, to determine what the total VA requirement is that UPS. The challenge here is um, most devices you look at will be measured in watts. So what you have to do is convert watts to VA. And the way this happens is you have to know the power factor of that UPS. Unfortunately, a lot of UPS manufacturers will not clearly publish their power factor. So this equation gets a little difficult to sometimes figure out. But you can go on Google, and there's a couple of engines that will give you the typical power factor of a UPS, and you can do your own calculations to figure out, based on the total number of wattage of my devices, how many VA I need on my, uh, on my UPS. Most UPSs are rated in KVA. You then need to deal with battery life, okay? So now that I've got my total VA output required, based on that VA output, how long will that battery last? And how long would I like it to last before either generator kicks in or I have time to shut things down gracefully? So those are the UPS decisions. Now, all of this can be very complicated. Um, and so luckily for us, great companies like Minuteman have produced these really fun configurator tools that make it really easy on us, right? So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at that now. Do you see my screen yet over there? Nothing. Nothing? All right, let me fix it. All right. Let me, let me, I got to fix my sharing. There we go. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and flip over to, um, you should be able to see my, my, uh, my uh, browser now. So I'm going to flip over to the tool called SizeMyUPS.com. So SizeMyUPS.com is a tool produced by Minuteman. And what's nice about this tool is it gives you the ability to very quickly program in your devices and determine how many KVA and what your load and capacity will be. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this from a basic equipment list. So like right behind me, let's say I wanted to power this little NVR box, this Bosch box, and I wanted to power like a Cisco power over Ethernet switch and maybe a couple of other devices. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So up here in the top, I can choose by a graphical icon. I'll click security. Okay, and then I'll choose the manufacturer. So I'm going to choose Bosch. And uh, once I've loaded Bosch, it'll give me an equipment list. And then I'm going to choose, you know, the box. So I have behind me, uh, I have their um, D-Bar products. So let's see if they've got D-Bar in here. I'm just, I haven't looked at this before, so I'm kind of hoping that it's there. Oh, it's there. That's good news. So there's the D-Bar. I'm going to add that to the list. This gives me what my total capacity with this one device is at this point in time. And now let's say I've got a Cisco product, right? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, find Cisco. I can't imagine that they don't have Cisco in there. Well, I, I'm under uh, Bosch Security. Let me see. Well, I would think they would have Cisco in there. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm under security. i got to go to networking. There we go. Sorry. 
So you've got to go to networking. And uh, there we go. Now I have Cisco. And now I can select uh, my switch model. And so you've got several models to choose from. From I will pick one that I believe is PoE, so uh, probably the 3660 series as a PoE. I'm going to add that. Now, of course, after I'm done adding these, I want to make sure that the wattage that's being shown here matches the product. I, you'll need to double check. I mean, don't trust this completely. Make sure you check and verify that the wattage is correctly is correct. But I'm going to go ahead and add the product, and now I'm up to 236 watts. And it's kind of giving me some ideas of what I want. Now I can choose several options, what my input voltage, output voltage is. And I can say how much growth I want to have and what my runtime is. So after I'm done adding all my devices, and I'm just going to stop. Oh, by the way, you have the ability to add your own. So let's say yours isn't in here. You can add your own device and put in the wattage calculation there as well. Uh, also, if, if, if you have a security device that's not on there, let them know. They add it pretty quickly. So uh, it's kind of nice. So anyway, you got that there. Now I'm done. I'm going to click Get Results. And down below, they've given me several products that will fit. But more importantly, over here to the right, they've told me how much runtime that will give me based on that model of product, based on the capacity. And they'll also tell me whether or not it's a line interactive or a standby UPS, which is great. So there's two products in here, two types of products that I use all the time. The first one is this EN750, and the second one is the, this Pro uh, 1500RT. One of them is basically a wall mount product for small devices. You can see the little picture there. And the other one is a rack mount device or a standalone device that's usually rack mount. That you stick in a rack that will power devices in that rack. So those are the two types that I use. You notice that one is a standby and one is a line interactive, right? So uh, those are the two types of devices. And of course, you have a wide variety of devices you can choose from. So this is the size my UPS tool. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of these products. We're going to take a close look now at the Inspire 750. Um, I'm going to move my camera down just a little bit. There we go. That's the Inspire. This is the Inspire 750 by Minuteman. Minuteman is not the only UPS manufacturers that makes these. Of course, Minuteman will say that they have the best, but there's a lot of them out there on the market. Many different UPS manufacturers produce these. Uh, Minuteman has a nice little LCD display uh, that you can see what the current load is and what the current output is, which is nice. Uh, and then you have surge only outlets on one side, and then you have battery and surge on the other side. It also protects things like coaxial cables and your phone lines. It's got a connection on here to hook to a computer so that the computer can be notified when it needs to shut down or that we can monitor this UPS with software. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Uh, the real advantage of this is being able to monitor the equipment with software. Why do I say that? Well, let me just talk about this for a minute. One of my biggest goals in physical security projects is to always increase the amount of money I make on every camera sold. So the way I do that is not just to consider the cameras themselves, but I also consider all the devices and all the configurations are required to make that camera work. This includes power. And if I can sell services and uh, other strategies to help manage and maintain a remotely monitor or remotely deploy my customer's environment, then I'm going to do so. So I'm always looking for devices like this that give me the ability to remotely manage them. And this one does give me the ability to manage them via a power uh, 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 management software, which I will show you in just a minute. However, this device is only for small capacity loads, and it's also a standby UPS. So it, it'll only work for devices that are not sensitive to the millisecond delay. For like, it's like a 10 millisecond delay. 
But this is very small footprint. It fits nicely on a wall or under a desk. This supplies 750 VA, hence the 750 name. And it does include Minuteman's warranty. Minuteman has a pretty good warranty, and they also have a guarantee against loss or damaged products. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at, um, so anyway, that's that product. And, you, and I provided some links to their product. Um, you'll find uh, on, on the online course, I have, um, I have all the links to all the, the white papers and all the data sheets for you uh, in a nice and easy, convenient place to find them. Be careful, by the way, when you first buy this UPS. When you first buy the UPS, I'm just going to show you something. On the back of it, you open up this little thing. You have to connect the battery down here. Uh, I don't recommend doing that with the power plugged in, but you want you have to connect the battery before you start the UPS. Basically, you just take the battery out and you connect the negative lead on the battery. So that's basically what you have to do when you first unpack the uh, the UPS. All right. As you can see here, here are the wall mount screw taps for wall mounting this device. Okay, I have plugged this thing in with a UPS. Uh, I mean, plug this in with USB. In just a minute, you're going to see how we can manage this remotely. Okay? Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one, which is the Pro 1500 RT. The Pro 1500 RT is designed for small rack mount or tower systems. I never buy it for the purposes of a tower, although some people do. I always buy it and put, the, put it in a rack. This particular product has a lot of management capabilities. And I always sell it with both the SNMP card expansion and the environmental probe expansion. Why? Well, I want to increase my longevity with that account that I sold this into. And more importantly, I want to add these on as services. Nothing, nothing looks more impressive to my customer than being able to provide them with statistics about their power consumption, alert them when there's a power outage, Tell them when their battery is having an issue. Tell them when their server room is overheating uh, or a variety of other things. The SNMP card expansion gives you the ability to remotely monitor this UPS with email alerts, SML, SMS alerts, text alerts, and also uh, a web interface. It also provides you with the ability to add an environmental probe. The environmental probe basically allows you to monitor the temperature and humidity in the server room and alert if one of those things are becoming an issue. This also provides you with an SNMP trap. Um, if you are big into SNMP, which if you're not, you should be, you'll have an SNMP software that manages your customers and it alerts you when things are going awry. And basically, this SNMP card that you plug into this UPS gives you that ability. Uh, just a, real quick, I'll show you what this UPS looks like. So down at the bottom here, you're looking at a live view of my server room. And down at the bottom is the Minuteman UPS right there. You see the little black box? And there's two buttons on there. If you hit one of the buttons, the LCD lights up, and it gives you the input voltage, any, any alerts or anything like that. Um, and it will warn you if it's got too much uh, draw on it. If you plug too many devices into it, it'll warn you. Believe me, you'll hear it. It's this large, loud squealing sound. Basically, it sounds like it's dying, because it is, uh, and uh, that's it. Um, and so that's the Minuteman UPS device right there. Fits very nicely into a uh, single rack, like a telecommunications rack style mount. OK? Uh, and so there you go. That's the live view of that particular device. All right. So, uh, and so somebody asked me the questions, does this support SNMP? It absolutely does. It supports SNMP version 3. And so uh, if using the latest and greatest SNMP software, um, there's a variety on the market. Um, I use all the free ones because um, I'm cheap. But uh, the, uh, I actually use one by HP. Um, and I also use a couple of open source SNMP monitoring tools. And both of those are great. By the way, every time I do a security project, I always install an SNMP software package at the customer site 
that allows me to monitor every device that I put into the network. Everything I'm showing you today supports SNMP with the exception of one device. So great, SNMP is awesome. Uh, I am planning to do an SNMP course, by the way, uh, and, and, and coming up this year to talk more in detail about SNMP and how to monitor it. Now that I've got more devices in the lab, they're SNMP capable, um, I want to start setting up some SNMP uh, monitoring ability, and I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the Sentry Plus software. The Sentry Plus software is the management software that Minuteman produces that allows you to manage this. This does not require SNMP to work, so if you're not an SNMP expert, you can use the uh, uh, Sentry software. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, bring that open. Maybe. Can you see it? Yeah, you got it. All right. So this is the Minuteman uh, software. What you're seeing right now is their graphical display. I am monitoring the Inspire 750 product down here on my desk. And you'll notice that this is a standby UPS. How can I tell it's a standby UPS? Well, just look at the graphic. The AC input is coming in, and it's going straight to the AC output. Uh, that means that... If I were to have a power loss, there would be a, br a brief millisecond, a few millisecond delay before it could slip, slip to battery. You'll notice right now the battery level is at 100%, and you can see all the different uh, frequency and voltage things uh, here displayed graphically. In addition, what's really nice about this software is I can choose multiple machines in my network. So if I have multiple servers or workstations with the Minuteman Sentry Plus software on it, I'm able to select those, and I'm able to view the UPS that is connected to those devices. In addition, I'm able to view and monitor any uh, UPSs that have the SNMP card in them, and I'm able to watch and monitor those devices. Or if I have a UPS plugged directly into the back of one of my servers in my rack, I'm able to monitor that as well. Uh, so, anyway, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do in here. I can shut my devices down remotely if I wanted to. I can do all my battery tests if I want to here. I can do simple tests, long-range tests. I can turn the alarm on, turn the alarm off, silent the alarm. I can do all these things that your customer will complain about uh, that you can do remotely pretty quickly and pretty easily. Plus, you can start charging them for maintenance activities, and now you have something really legitimate that you can do once every month, which is battery tests on their EPS. So this is the checkbox. As you prepare your 100-point maintenance inspection, whatever you want to call it, every month you'll be doing particular functions, and this is something you can do very easily within a monitoring software such as this. You also have a wizard in which we can do a shutdown. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. This particular thing allows you to decide if I want the Sentry software to shut the machine down if there is a lapse in power or if the battery becomes low. So you can set those wizards up and have that automatically happen. You get a nice graphical history of all the power levels that you've had. You can see that uh, over the last 20 seconds, over the last day, over the last hour. You can see that over a year, over a month, and you can see what all the voltage is, that kind of stuff like that, like that. You get a nice little uh, meter that tells you what all the battery voltage are, battery levels, input frequencies, input voltages are, all that kind of stuff. Finally, I'll show you the tree. The tree is where I spend all my time. It allows me to see all the UPS devices in my network. It tells me anybody that has a bad status, low battery, battery in need of repair, anybody who's suffering from low output, low voltage. Uh, it gives me the IP addresses of any devices that I'm monitoring. It gives me all these things right here and produces an event log that I can see. So this is a pretty powerful software that you can use to control this. Um, and it tells you firmware versions and types and size of UPSs. So this is a software. Now, um, so I ran a security company for like 12 years, right? So 
<laughs> you'd be surprised. I tell my technician, go out and install the UPS at customer. They go out and they install the UPS. What do they think installing the UPS means? Plug it into the wall, plug the devices into the outlets, and leave. Well, what installing the UPS also means is to set up the software so that you can monitor it, set up the server so that it will shut down gracefully, and set up traps so that we can monitor the health and power environment checks, all that kind of stuff. Very important to incorporate power as part of your overall scheme to manage, maintain, and get more money out of your customer, right? So uh, that's, that's something that definitely you want to focus on. All right, so we're now moving on to uh, outside plants. So I'm going to take a pause here and ask if anybody has any questions about UPS systems uh, or my comments or, or, or anything else. Does anybody have any questions about UPS before I move on away from uh, UPS power? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'll go ahead and roll right forward. So now we're moving on to out, outside plan. If you don't know what outside plan is, the first security project you do where you install a camera on a wall outside of a building, you'll now know it. So that's outside plan. Many small end people that have never done large uh, cabling projects, I was a structured cabling contractor for a while, so obviously I had exposure to it. Um, you don't realize that there are a lot of regulations and complexity with running cable on the outside of a building and having that transition to cable on the inside of the building. Uh, the outside cabling infrastructure we call outside plant. This is a term we borrow from the telecommunication industry. The telecommunication industry has a lot more regulation uh, when it comes to outside plant. And the reason is is because they have to deal with a lot of different environments all throughout the country. And the government and others have a very vested interest to make sure they don't put cabling systems in that would, where a lightning strike could kill people. However, we have to deal with it as well, even if we're just running one cable on an outside of the building, transitioning to inside of the building, we have to deal with it as well. So this is whenever you have a uh, camera where you need to convert OSP cable, which is thicker cable, weatherproof cable, usually with some sort of rigidness applied to it uh, that is usually uh, resistant to UV radiation. This type of cable is thicker, harder to manage, um, but that cable will eventually make its way into a building. Now, if this is copper cabling, it'll go into a building, and because of its being copper cable, it has to be terminated within 50 feet of the inside the building. You're not allowed to run the cable from the outside straight to electronic devices. You have to terminate it into a grounded connection. Now, for class four devices, devices that are in very harsh environments or that are highly susceptible to elect electrical issues, then you have to, you know, there's certain regulations about what you can do. But for smaller end things like a security camera, you don't need to go that elaborate on terminating the cable into a grounded connection. You can actually keep it rather simple. However, grounding is required. Normally, the cable will come into the building and go into an entrance facility or into some facility where there is a grounded connection. Grounded usually means that an electrician has installed a bus bar inside that room, and that bus bar is going into a ground tap which has been grounded and tested to be ground. If that doesn't exist, then sometimes people will tie it into or weld it into a cold water tap, a cold water pipe that goes in the ground, and sometimes that works too. If you can test it with a multimeter, make sure you're making sure that it actually is grounded. But grounded is absolutely uh, required, and the general rule of thumb is you're not allowed to go into the building past 50 feet without having it reach a grounding source. Now there's different classifications that are required for you to meet this requirement, but for most of us that do security projects, we will want a single device that will terminate a CAT5 or CAT6 run when it comes in from the outdoors into a punch block that can be grounded, and then we'll take that and go normal cable from that point to our patch panel 
or to our device or wherever it happens to be. We do this to protect against lightning strikes, but we also do this to protect our equipment against voltage, uh, overage and voltage, and a variety of other reasons. Now, there are a lot of products in the market. The one product I'm going to show you today is actually a really simple product, which I'm assuming that a lot of you, based on your poll results here, a lot of you are rather new to this type of industry. So I'm going to show you one of the most simple products in the market, and I'm going to move my camera down again. Here you go. This is called the uh, MMS Cat6 PoE, or what Minuteman calls the line guard product. This is a very simple product that you mount to the wall inside an entrance facility. There's screw holes provided. You simply screw it to the wall, and your out outdoor plant cable comes in to the line inside, and your inside cable comes out the other side. Pretty simple, right? Well, basically, what you do is you pop the case off, and you have punch blocks. So what happens is your outdoor cable comes in, your outdoor plant cable comes in, and you mount it inside here, and then you punch the cable. And you'll notice that it's got blue, orange, green, brown, and basically you match the colors to the punch block, very simple, and you put the cable in there. So let's do one of them. I don't want to spend it hours while you watch me fidget and try to do a punch down. That's always fun. So basically, you do the white pair first, uh, and you basically stick it in there like that. You want to give yourself enough room so that the little clip here holds it. So you'll go over and you'll put it into the punch block like that. This would be the outside plant side of the cable. Now, it's not that just good enough to sit it in there. You require a 110 punch down tool. It has to be 110 punch down. And you have to have the impact setting on the punch down tool set to high. You then need to get a blade tool, and you want the blade tool that has got the sharp end on it. And what you do is on the opposite side of where you want to put the cable, you're going to punch it down, sharp end side on where you want to cut it, and then you're going to simply punch it into the block like that. Preferably, you do it with a blade that is sharp. Mine's been dull from use. If it's the sharp blade, these little cable ends should just pop right off. But mine's uh, a little bit dull. But you get the idea. Notice that the little brown cable there came off. So that's how you punch down the connection. Then what you do is you take your interior cable on the other side, and you repeat it on this side, and you punch it down. You're not done yet. The most important ingredient is you have to ground it. And there is a grounded tap right here. You'll see this little metal thing right here. Basically, you run grounding wire from this metal connection here, the screw. You run the grounding into a place where it is grounded, usually tied into a bus bar. Um, you'll need to buy some grounding cable for this. Grounding cable is always green in color. And uh, a 16 gauge will probably do fine. And you'll run that in there. And this is only rated up to so many volts, by the way. So it can handle a, a, a voltage limit of like, you know, a certain, uh, certain amount. Uh, but it will generally handle uh, most electronic surges coming in through from the outdoors. Uh, in addition, what's really nice about this, uh, this particular device, and you've got to pay attention to this, is this device will allow PoE to pass. Most uh, outdoor blocks that you buy will not pass PoE, which means power over Ethernet will hit here and it'll immediately get grounded. Well, that's horrible if I'm trying to do PoE from indoor to outdoor. So this particular device will allow PoE to pass up to 68 volts. Anything above 68 volts will go to the ground source. So this is the uh, Minuteman line guard product. Very, very much needed product when doing physical security. All right, let's go ahead and talk about power management in the rack. Does anybody have any questions about uh, outside plant terminations? All right, let's go ahead and move on then. Let's talk about power management in the rack. So when you do a physical security project, you will always have pro product that comes back into a server room or into a distribution facility. 
When it does so, you will inevitably have some sort of rack, usually 19-inch telecommunication style, in which you need to mount your equipment. This always requires a PDU. Now, the customer normally provides a PDU. Be surprised on how many customers don't have PDUs in their racks, and they've got power strips hanging out the back, or their PDUs are not manageable. So I'm going to talk to you about providing a manageable PDU. Um, by the way, somebody did ask me a question about the line guard. I didn't get to. I'll answer that now. On the line guard product, um, they asked me, can it be used as an extender? The answer to that is no. Uh, it does not extend. It does not have a power source, so it does not extend. However, it will not interrupt an extender. So I will show you an extender product later on, and the extender product will not be interrupted by the line guard. So it will only go 100 meters. So you got to consider 100 meters from the point of your switch or PoE device, your PSC device, all the way to your power device. So you got to you got to consider that fully 100 meters. So it does not extend power, but it will not interrupt uh, an extender. So that that's that's an important consideration. So let's talk about power management in the PDU. We want to have a PDU. Basically, a PDU is an over-glorified um, uh, PDU is an over-glorified power strip, right? So, but we don't want just a power strip. We want one that's manageable. Let me show you an image of a manageable one in my in my rack. So here we are. I'm going to share this guy. You see it? Yeah. You should see them side by side now, right? Got it. All right, so right there, you're looking at my server room, and I have a managed PDU in the server room. You can see it's the, it's the thing with uh, two plugs going into it that says 1.0 on the side, right? You see the little green lights? Notice there's an Ethernet cable coming out the back of it. That Ethernet cable is plugged into my network, and I'm able to manage this PDU remotely. So this is really a critical uh, to, uh, security, uh, to security. Why? Because I want the ability to remotely power to my devices remotely. I want to power devices remotely. And I want to be able to turn them on, turn them off. Uh, customer calls, says there's a complaint, complaint. I want to reboot them. I want to monitor and manage my load to know if I'm a problem. And if I'm using SNMP, which I hope you will, uh, this is also SNMP equivalent. So I'm able to get alerts and notifications from my PDU unit to SNMP. So I can monitor, manage load. I can oh, and also I can control the individual outlets. So I can turn power off on one outlet, but turn power on the other outlet. I can also schedule power outages. So let's say, for example, I'm not using my security equipment after uh, five o'clock at night. I can power them down at five p.m. and power them back up at eight a.m. So this is why power management at the rack is so critical. Hopefully, you business owners out there or you salespeople, dollar signs are going off in your head. You now have the ability not only to sell this device, but more importantly, you have the ability to manage this device and provide this as part of your maintenance contract that you give to the customer. So that's that. So let's go ahead and take a look at a close-up look at the RPM 1581. The RPM 1581, the 8 means the number of outlets. You'll notice that there are eight outlets. This is a Minuteman product. It has a, I think it has a 16 or eight ports, um, and it can be vertical or horizontal rack, um, and you can manage multiple multiple of these at once with one package of software. Uh, it supports 120 volt or 208 volt. It does email, SMS, and SMP, and you can hit it with a web browser, which, by the way, we're going to do right now because that's really fun. So we're going to go and hit. Uh, the Minuteman, yeah, this is it. No, that's not it. Let me find it. Give me a minute. <clears throat> One of these tabs. There we go. I've now hit, uh, hopefully you can see that. Can you see it, Fred? All right, good job. We can now see the uh, Minuteman uh, uh, RPM product. You'll notice my load right now is one amp. Do you see that? I have a load of one amp on this RPM, and my status is normal. Notice it'll give me an overload warning at 15 amps. I can set that to be whatever I want. Uh, in addition, 
I can control each outlet. I can turn all these outlets on or off. Notice all my outlets are on. If I wanted to completely disrupt, disrupt my WebEx session right now, I could power off my switch. Or off outlet B, I could power off my firewall. Because I have my switch, my, my firewall plugged into there. Uh, but if I can maybe have an NDR or a power supply that powers my cameras or whatever. I can power those off with these outlets simply with an on-off switch. You can do these in groups. So rather than doing individually, I can power the outlets off in groups. I can also schedule them. I can schedule them to be on certain days, certain times, and I can have the power on, power off on a different schedule, which is really a powerful feature. I love this feature, and you network geeks out there will love it too. I can actually have the RPM ping all of my physical security devices, and it'll ping them, and if it is unable to resolve it via ping, I can have it automatically by action uh, turn it off and then turn it back on again. This is awesome. So let's say I'm unable to ping my camera or my, my uh, wireless device that's out in the field or whatever, and I want to have it remotely power. I can have a power on, power off, uh, and, and do so. I can set a response time on this so that it doesn't sit there and cycle it all day long and all night long, you know. So I have the ability to have it power uh, by ping action, which is, which is great. Uh, I can set delays, so I can, after it comes back on, I can delay power to the outlet for a few seconds before it powers off. I can also delay the power off, so it's not, uh, I can set my thresholds. And down below is where I can set my mail, my SNMP, SSL connection to the device, and time. Now, I want you to notice something. Notice that this web interface is really small. Do you see how small that square is? Well, because it's been designed to work on a mobile phone. So if I have remote access to my customer, I can log into this and hit it with a mobile phone, and I can control the RPM unit from a phone with real quick, easy touch buttons on my, my Droid or Apple phone. Very good. So that's the RPM uh, remote power management device. I think these are awesome, and I think you should add it on er you should add a device like this on every security system that you sell. I, I do because I want the maintenance contracts. All right, let's take a look at power management at the edge. Do I have any questions, by the way, about um, do I have any questions uh, about the uh, the power management at the rack with an RPM device? Okay, I don't see any questions. Let's go ahead and talk about power management at the edge. So RPM devices are not just needed. Uh, at the um, rack. They are also needed at the edge. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we have outdoor enclosures or we have um, power units that power a door or they power a, an access control unit or they power a pan tilt zoom engine or they power a heater blower or they power a wireless access point or something like that. So we have a, a divide AC power well, if I have AC power going into my outdoor enclosure or whatever, I might as well put in an RPM device that allows me to manage that power remotely. I want this because difficult reach locations, I want power management. I don't want to have to get a lift out every time I have a power issue. I want to be able to remotely power uh, that device. Also, during times when there's no light or during times when there's a scheduled maintenance activity, I don't want to have to have that thing shut down automatically. I want to control when it shuts down and control when it comes back up. And so if I want to be able to have an RPM device that does that. I want to be able to reboot remotely. Um, and I want all the features that I've talked about at the rack at the edge. So, well, introducing RPM, a device like this, RPM 1521. Minuteman's not the only manufacturer that makes these, but Minuteman donated the equipment, so I get to show you that. So let's go ahead and take a look at RPM 1521. This is a two outlet device. I'm going to flip my video now over to my cable. So you're going to see uh, my cable shot. There you go. You see on my table now the RPM 1521 device. Uh, you can stretch your video a little bigger if you want to, but you now have the RPM 1521 device. I'll stand up and point it out.
So that's the RPM 1521 device. Notice it has two outlets. Notice it has a network cable coming up the back of it. It provides me a web interface. And this is perfect for small enclosures or small areas where I want a device. Now, it also has a web interface. So I'm now going to share that with you. Um, here is the device, and I'm going to log on to the web interface. Got it right? You can see it? All right. So here, here we go with the uh, – um, here we go with the uh, power manager device. The interface looks a little different, but it's basically the same features. Notice that I am able to, um, I am able to very easily click on, click off, reboot, shut it off, shut it on. I can reboot the outlets, do whatever I want. Pretty nice. Uh, I can also set up a schedule uh, to have it reboot or power off whenever I want it to. Um, I also can set up mail, SMS for texting, SNMP, uh, and basic network settings. Um, it's got a firewall built in. If I don't want anybody accessing this, I can filter based on IP or Mac. I have all my NTP time settings. I have an event log where I can watch what's going on. So that's basically what I have the options for in the remote power management. And I can click on this and just reboot my devices or power them off, right? So right here, if I were to click on one of them, I could reboot that device. Um, I don't know if I have a light showing in there that you can see. Let me see if I do. Hold on. Can you see that light in that picture? Uh, let me take a better image of that. I don't know if you can see that. Nah, forget it. You can't see the light very well. Now, maybe if I showed you this. Let me try it. Yeah, you can see the light. Can you see the light in that picture? I think you can. You might move the camera out of the way. I've got a bigger blown-up picture. You might be able to see the light. Yeah, you see the light right there? Now, that is plugged into outlet number one, right? So uh, if that's plugged into outlet number one, I can basically go to the remote power unit, and uh, I can say, you know what? Off. Let's turn that, let's turn that guy off. It's now off. Let me go back to that. Oh, look, the light is gone. Wow, remote power management right there. So uh, now if I wanted to turn that light back on, turn my POE device back on, I can simply go here, and I can turn that guy on. And now uh, I'll go back to live view, and there goes the light. So we were able to turn back on using our remote power management device. Very good. So that's remote power management for small enclosures, which is a great device. We'll be highlighting this project product again in my next class. Uh, okay. All right, I'm now done with power management, and I'm ready to move on to power over Ethernet. So does anybody have any questions about remote power management or anything else I've talked about before I move on to POE? All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I will move on. Very good. All right, let me flip my video back over to see my lovely face, and then we'll uh, we'll move on with uh, we'll move on with POE terms. All right, let's talk about POE. All right, I'm going to boil this down to its absolute basic. I'm not going to get too complex. Some of you on this phone are are salespeople. Some of you are technicians. I've added some slides towards the end here to talk about some more of the technical geeky stuff, but I want to make sure that everybody has a base understanding of PoE, because PoE is not as easy as just buying a PoE switch, right? It's not that simple. I wish it was, but it's not. So one of the challenges of PoE is the industry was, the IEEE was kind of behind. So manufacturers are creating ways to power devices over Ethernet before the industry kind of caught up. And now that the industry's kind of caught up and it's becoming more formal, it's like before that happened, it was like the Wild West when it came to POE. Everybody's doing what they wanted, when they wanted. So you had all these different POE versions. But here are the basic terminologies you need to understand. First off, the device that provides the power is called the PSE, Power Sourcing Equipment. The device that gets the power, which could be a camera, wireless access point, 
TV, uh, computer, um, phone, you, uh, you name it, that is a powered device. In this case, we're talking cameras, so it's a camera. By the way, we also have access control for doors and readers and stuff like that that are also PDs as well. So you have a PSD and your PD. If you provide a Ethernet switch that it has a built-in PSC, that is called an end span. If you have a normal switch in which you're supplementing power with a separate PSC device, that is called a mid span. End span provides the power, mid span provides the PSC. Cisco would like you to buy end spans. Micro Semi, the power company, the power company for power reset, would like you to provide buy mid spans. Make sense? Uh, they both have good arguments as to why you buy one or the other. I'm not going to present those arguments. I'm going to show you what you need and why you would need it, and you make the call. So those are your POE terms, and let's go ahead and focus now on power over Ethernet. So this is power over Ethernet, the first version, or the standard version. You'll oftentimes people call this regular POE, POE uh, uh, standard. Sometimes you'll hear them call it type 1 PoE. That's actually incorrect, but they'll call it type 1 PoE. Uh, or you'll sometimes hear them call it AF. A the IEEE standard 802.3 AF uh, was revised in 2003, and this is now a current standard for normal 15.4 watt DC power over Ethernet. 15.4 watt power over Ethernet provides voltages from 44 VDC to 57 VDC, and it can be sent over CAT3 or greater cabling. It basically goes 100 meters, uh, starting out at 15.4 watts, but as it goes over your standard Ethernet gauge copper cabling, and it goes over 100 meters, it'll be at, it's, it must provide at least 12.95 watts when it gets to that end. Most power over Ethernet devices actually deliver more after 100 meters than that, which means you can get away with more than 100 meters, right? I've known people to stretch it, right? They're going 315 feet, 330, 350 feet, and they're still able to make it work, right? Be careful, though. Just because you can make your POE work over 100 meters in ice cold conditions does not mean that that same POE will work at 12.95 watts at 100 degree temperatures. As the temperature climbs, as the cable warms up, your wattage will decrease uh, with temperature. So be careful. I, I've been stung on this myself. Customer said, well, hey, it'll work at 380 feet. Why don't we just do that? Well, guess what? Summertime customers call me. Guy, I have this weird problem. When it gets to be 105 degrees, my camera's cut out. Well, now I know why, right? Because the length of the cable was not enough to deliver. It was too much. The 12.95 watts dropped below what the camera required due to the temperature increase of the cable. So power dissipation is definitely something to be considered when selling a project. If you stay within 100 meters, you're generally okay as long as, as long as you have good cabling. I mean, you, maybe you buy this really knockoff cheap cabling that's unable to maintain uh, across 100 meters, but that's pretty doubtful. Power with AF is supplied in mode A or mode B. Mode A or mode B is decided by the end span or the mid span. If it's, if it's an end span, meaning it's provided by the switch, it usually comes in mode A. If it's done by a mid-span, it's typically provided in mode B. The end device that gets the PoE has to be able to support either or it's not truly an AF standard. So it has to be able to recognize when it's A or recognize when it's B and be able to support it. Now, mode A sends the transmit and receive. Um, mode A sends the power over your transmit and receive pairs. This allows a crossover cable or auto sensing um, uh, uh, abilities in mode A. This is why most switches or end spans send power over your transmit and receive pairs. Now you may be wondering, Guy, how is it possible to send power over transmit and receive pairs? It does it with what is called 
phantom signaling, right? And I'm not going to get into that. But that's a fun topic. Google it. Uh, if you want to know it, uh, in the music industry, the first one that came up with this, you have a microphone, right? A microphone that uh, receives both power and sends audio over one cable. And they do this with a phantom signaling method. Same thing happens with PoE over your transmit and receive pairs. Mode B sends your DC and return over, uh, uh, over the spare wires in the, uh, in the category uh, 3, 5, or 6 cable. So uh, normal Ethernet has spare pairs. And so Mode B uses those spare pairs for your return. Uh, for your, your sending your power and your return. Okay? So there you go. By the way, gigabit speeds are still capable. You may be thinking, well, wait a minute. If mode B requires these spare pairs, if I'm using gigabit speeds, gigabit speeds requires all four pairs in the wire, right? Well, then how can mode B support gigabit? Well, most B support gigabit because mode B mid spans also support this phantom ability to send power uh, at the same time they're sending the uh, data communication. So 1,000 megabits is now possible with this PoE standard. All right. Let's take a look at an actual device um, that, that is um, capable of uh, – let's take a look at an actual device that is capable of – uh, standard PoE. This is the PoE 3501G product. So I'm going to share my uh, screen. Can you see that, Fred? Can you see the video? Yeah. All right. So you look at, you see a large screen I'm displaying to you right now. Uh, and the little white one over to the right there, the, uh, or over to the right side, the white one there is the 3501G. This is capable of 10, 100, 1000. It is a mid span. It delivers power over the spare pairs. And its output voltage is 48 VDC, and it delivers 15.4 watts. So if you have a device that requires normal PoE, this is a perfect mid-span for doing so. Uh, let me show you one feature of it real quick. <coughs> right? So um, so Fred, come here for a little bit. What I'm going to have you do, Fred, is I want you to plug this into here, right, for getting power. And I want you to plug this device into there, and, and when I tell you to do it, show it. All right, so my assistant here is going to show you what happens. So here we have a, uh, a mid-span that is providing power over Ethernet over the spare pairs. And I'm going to prove that to you by using the MicroSemi PoE tester product. So he is going to plug the... Uh, data and power side of this mid-span into the micro-semi device. So go ahead and do that, Fred. There you go. Now, what I want you to do is hold that up. Notice there's a green light on, this, on the left side. There's a little key there, Fred. You might need to read it for us. What does it mean when there's a green light on just the left-hand side? The 802.3. 802.3. And does it say AF or AT? AF. It's AF. So it's 802.3 AF across four pairs. Is that what it says? Correct. Or two pairs? Four pairs. So over spare. Notice it says over spare. So this is 802.3 AF over the spare wires. So that's what that mid-span is. By the way, let me show you how this would actually connect in a real environment to a camera. So, Fred, what I want you to do, uh, we have the we have a, a small switch right here. What I want you to do here is you're going to plug, you're going to go from this port right here, right? You're going to go into the data end, and then you're going to plug this into the camera. Got it? So let's do that. So Fred is going to now demonstrate how to plug a camera into the mid-span. So we've got a normal eight-port switch here. 
He's going to now plug that neural port into the data inside of the mid-span. And now he's going to take the mid-span cable that is now providing power and plug it into my Axis uh, uh, IP camera there, and we will now power the camera. And we just want to prove that that worked, Fred. So can you show the lights blinking on the camera? There, we got lights. That means we actually powered the camera. Very good, Fred. That's awesome. Thank you very much. By the way, Fred, just to prove uh, that that the mid-span provides power over the spare and a switch does not, let's test one of the switches to prove what happens. So let's do that right now. So here we have a switch. Now this switch, this switch provides four power meters of course. So what I want you to do is plug this into here. And I want you to plug this into here and we'll see what it comes back with. So Fred is now going to plug. So that switch you see there from TrendNet has four PoE ports and four non-PoE ports. He's going to plug the cable into one of the PoE ports. So go ahead and do that. Plug it into one of the PoE ports. And now plug that into our tester. Now, what light do we get, if any? Nothing yet. Uh-oh. Are they for it light? Yeah, it should have gotten a light. Hold on, that's weird. Well, we are not powering for anybody. <laughs> Boy, baby steps, baby steps, all right? Sorry, we had to actually power our switch first. Boy, we're, we're rocket scientists here. All right, so there we go. Now we're getting a different light. What is the light we're getting now? It is, I'm sorry, I can't see. Over 802.3AF over uh, D. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, 802.3F over data. So this, is, um, so this is different than the mid-span, right? From the switch, it's 802.3AF over data. Over the mid-span, it's 802.3 .3 over uh, spare pairs, right? If you can understand this, you will get PoE. And when you're talking PoE with the network guys at some company, you'll be like a genius. Most people don't get this. I think I interview one out of 20 people at a security show and nobody will know it, right? They just don't get it. So this is the way to figure it out. This little micro semi tester really helps prove the point. So there you go. So that's how you how you do that. So awesome. That is providing power over 802.3.af with a mid span. Let's go ahead and take a look now at the power over Ethernet plus. All right. So we're done demoing now, Fred, for just a minute. We'll get back to you in a minute. So we're at PoE plus. Now, we'll say PoE and we'll put a plus on it, or you'll hear people say PoE plus. Now, people will mistakenly say high power. High power and PoE plus are different. High, OP, high power is an emerging standard, which we'll talk about in a minute. PoE plus is the standard. So it's very important to understand the difference, because people will mistakenly say high PoE. And high, OP, high PoE is not PoE plus. All right, this standard is IEEE 802.3 AT, and it was revised in 2009. This is the absolute latest PoE standard. There are several drafts being worked on. One of them is actually the high PoE standard, which will be a revision of the 802.3 AT. But 802.3 AT includes the latest PoE standard. This is backwards compatible with 802.3 AF with type 1 devices. Um, with type 1 and type 2. Devices that can be powered uh, with, uh, if you have a device that cannot be powered with less than 12.95 watts, then that device must say so when you plug it in. It's got to have some sort of warning indicator that it's not getting enough power. So if you have a device that requires more than 12.95 watts, it will not work with AF, then it must indicate with some sort of warning that it requires some other type of power. Devices that are capable of 12.95 watts must have the ability of digressing back to uh, type 1 PSC devices. So a type 1 device that is normally only supplying 802.3 AF. So if you have a device that will support more than 12.95 watts of power, 
but it will also support 12.95 watts of power, it must accept both a type 1 and a type 2 PSC device. So that's what the standard says. Sounds complicated, but that's a backwards compatibility uh, idea. <clears throat> PoE Plus provides 30 watts of power. Now, it is possible with PoE Plus to provide 60 watts of power, but we only provide 30 watts of power over two pairs. The standard says it's PoE over two pairs. It is possible to provide power over four pairs and thus increases the 60 watts. When we do that, that is called high PoE. So when you send power over all four pairs, it has now become high PoE. High PoE will be labeled as such. If you have got a product that is capable of delivering power over all four wires, the product itself will say high PoE on it. Let me show you real quick. I'll put that right there. Yeah. I don't know if you can see that, but you see that little, well, it's kind of shiny. Fred, can you move that around? It's a little shiny from the fluorescent lights. Fred's going to, no, you're in front of the camera. you got to walk around the table. There you go. Other side of the table. So as you move it around there, you'll see, there you go. Do you see that little logo? It says high PoE. That means that particular device is going to deliver power over all four wires, okay, giving it 60 watts of power. Let's just prove that real quick, Fred. Uh, unplug our switch. There you go. And plug that into our high PoE device. Now plug our tester. Unplug the cable from the switch. And plug that into the data and power out port on the inject on the mid span. Now we should get a light on our deal. Oh, look at that. What is, what, two blue lights. What does that say? Oh, I'm sorry. They can't see you. I, I made a mistake. You need to hold that in view. I, I, I disrupted people's view. I was move it down further. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. 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 Right about here. There you go. So first off, let's show show them the label so they can see the label. Very good. All right. Sorry for the mishap. There's the label. See the high PoE label. And now look at the micro semi adapter. We got two blue lights. And what do those two blue lights indicate, uh, Fred? 802.3ET. AT. Uh, uh -huh. It's 802.3ET, four pair, which means high, high PoE, right? So that is a high PoE device capable of delivering 60 watts. Now, you have some devices out on the market that need 60 watts. Now, they may actually support 60 watts right over the Ethernet cable, or they may require a splitter at the other end, where you put the cable into the splitter, and you split out the power in the form of a DC connector, and then you split out the Ethernet. But that's what a high PoE device works. Most PTZ cameras on the market support uh, require that type of PO, high PoE device. You can put that down now, Fred. We're done with that. All right. So, everybody understand that? Two pairs, 30 watts, 25.5 watts delivered to the PD. Four pairs, 60 watts delivered at 51 watts to the power device. All right, let's take a look at uh, the Power Design 9001 GR. This particular product is capable of 10, 100, 1000. It's 80.3 AT. It does not deliver power over all four pairs. It delivers power only over the spare pairs. And therefore, it only delivers 36 watts at the receiving end. I'm going to have Fred demonstrate this for us now. So hopefully you can see the, the picture here. Fred, this is the device we're talking about right here. This is the 9001. So what I want you to do is plug this in, and let's test the data with our micro semi device. So Fred is now showing us the mid-span that is the 9001 that is delivering uh, PoE plus over two pairs. This is not high PoE. So plug our power in. There you go. You got a light. Good job. Now plug the micro semi tester into the data power outside. All right, now we got different lights. What do we got? We got one blue light. And what does the one blue light mean?
over data, 802, right through EF over data. Let's see. No, it's over spare. So I that's, need that. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I can't read that either. That's why I was having you read it, but we're, we're, too, uh, <laughs> we're changing to the scale. It says 802.3 AT with power over spare is what that means. So it's hard to read the very really small print. But that's, that's what that is. So therefore, that PoE device is your standard PoE Plus mid-span. Okay? Uh, there you go. Pretty nice, huh? Let's take a look at the next product. These two products are the 9501G, which I just showed you. Fred just showed you the big black brick right there. Pick that one up again, Fred. No, the other one, the other brick. All right. Yeah, that is it right there. And, uh, um, oh, by the way, somebody asked me, surge lightning protectors, will they pass POE? They will usually pass up to 60 watts. So they're usually 60 watts is right about the limit. Sometimes greater, sometimes less. You've got to make sure you, you pay attention to it. So if you've got a lightning arrestor inside your enclosure on the outdoor and it's un incapable of passing 60 watts, you got a problem, right? You got to make sure you pay attention to that. They're now selling lightning arresters that will pass 60 watts. Great question, by the way. Um, all right, so there's the high power PoE device. Now, what I want you to do, everybody, is take a look. Fred, there's a device that's in a white box. It looks like an outdoor enclosure. You see it? That right there. The 9501G and the other big black high PoE one device, Fred, pick that one up. That one right there, those two products are identical. So the white one and that one are identical products. The white one is just simply in an outdoor rated enclosure. It's an IP66 rated enclosure. It uses four pairs for power transmission. It's 60 watts for high power PoE. And Fred, can you point out the screws onto the side of it? There's little screws there. You see the screws sticking out the side of it? Right there. It's a grounding connection. You see it? Right there, you got it. That grounding connection is to tie into ground or to tie into your lightning arrestor in the outdoor enclosure or to tie into the grounding source and the pole you mount it to. So that is your high power PoE mid span for outdoor installations. And then you've got your interior one that Fred was already showing you. Notice the weatherproof steel tight connections. Show them that, show the camera the, the connections with the screw things on it, the little. No, on the other side. Right here, yeah, show them that. So they can see the, the... So those are the, yeah, move the caps. Yeah, see so you got your UTP connections right there, your RJ45 connections right there. Very good, Fred. We're done demoing. Very good question. Somebody asked me, when should you do lightning arresting? It is always best if you have a pole to suppress the lightning at the pole and have it grounded into the pole. A lot of people will do this to the neutral wire on the three-phase wiring coming into the pole. Most people will do, most electricians will go and do that. A lot of electricians, especially for real expensive lighting, will have separate grounding source for the pole. In that case, you should ground the lightning arrestor right into that. Always do it at the pole. In addition, the cable will come into the building, and you are required by building codes to terminate the cabling into surge arrest, into uh, uh, some method to prevent surges right there inside the entrance facility. So you're actually required to do both. Um, the small lightning arresters you can install inside an outdoor enclosure are pretty cheap. They're easy to do. And you basically can tap right into those and ground them right there. So this outdoor mid-span would just wire right into a lightning arrestor that would go right to a ground source. Your cable would then go into a building and then terminate into a, into a block. Uh, and there's real nice ones, too. I, I, I just showed you a simple one-port one, but they'll terminate into a block there, and that's where you'll ground it there as well. All right. Questions for me? before I move on to the really, really, really cool product. I saved the best for last. Any more questions for me?
Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. We're now going to take a look at power of, ooh, I went the wrong way. We're going to take a look at some emerging standards. There's lots of emerging POE standards. The big one that everybody's talking about right now is the emergence of EEPOE. Uh, this is, uh, the standard has not been fully ratified yet. It's called 802.3AZ, or Energy Efficient Ethernet, EEE standard. Uh, this has been nicknamed EEPOE by somebody who wrote a white paper. And uh, it's been nicknamed by that. And it basically saves you wattage per channel, and therefore, Therefore, it's called energy efficient PoE. It requires that the device you're providing PoE from has management capability of those PoE features, and it improves the efficiency of delivering 30 watts PoE plus by using four pairs. So you can deliver 30 watts over four pairs, and therefore we increase the efficiency of the power delivery. This is not official standard yet, because delivering 30 watts over four pairs is not part of the standard. It's delivering 30 watts over two pairs, which is currently the standard. So let's take a look at a product that does this EEPOE stuff. And this is called the 9524G product. You're seeing behind me right here a picture of it on my screen. And Fred, can you walk up here and plug into the device that looks like a big switch? Just, just show them. Put your hand on it. That's it right there. That's the 95. Uh, 24. This is high PoE capable. Point your finger to the logo that says high PoE on the front. There's a logo on the front right there. You see the high PoE logo? That's it. That's the high PoE logo. So it's also capable of delivering 60 watts over four pairs. And basically it's a 24 port mid span. It has USB management, SNMP management, it also has web management, and it's also managed via a software package. It also has a web management. It does email alerts and other stuff like that as well. Notice it has a UTP Ethernet cable coming into it. Point to that, Fred, the, 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 that cable is going into it. That means it has an IP address, and I can manage it remotely. This device provides 50% 50, 50 less power than a switch and mid-span together. So this provides a significant less power. It also supports SNMP version 3. It supports the latest, uh, latest AT standards, including uh, the Event 2 classification, which is complicated stuff, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at what the interface looks like. Here it is. I'm now logged on to PowerView Pro. I'm looking at the uh, 9524 a uh, G device, and I can manage this device's power remotely. So basically, I can go to port configuration, and the, the best part is here, I can disable and turn on ports. Why is this a power management function? Well, think about it. If I have all 24 ports sucking power, and I don't need them all to have power, then I should just turn them off. So you can enable and disable the ports as you need to to save power. <clears throat> I can also change the wattage of these connections. Notice that I have, all of these are right now supplying the max power of 72 watts per channel. I can, if I want to, lower these down. So for example, I'm gonna take port 11, and I'm gonna lower port 11 down to 14 watts. And I'm gonna update and save. So port, port 11 is now, uh, uh, providing only 14 watts of power, right? So I can control which ports are providing which types of power in order to save on energy and save what I'm doing. Let's take a look at that real quick. Brad, we've got our access camera. Let's go ahead and uh, plug this into the data power out, the top one on port 11, and plug that into our camera. So, Fred, I'm going to go ahead and flip back over so you can see this. There you go. Fred's got our camera. He's plugged into port 11. He's now plugging our access camera into port 11. And let's see if it powers on 14 watts of power. Do we have green lights? Woo, we do. So it does work. So I, even though I'm only providing 14 watts of power, it's working. Let's see if we can really make this access camera upset, though, however. 
So I'm going to go here to port 11. Let's drop that down to 2 watts of power. And what happens to our green light? Anything? Does it stay there? It's green. It's green. Oh, boy. It's working still. I wonder why that is. Well, I guess it is because the access camera doesn't require that much power to sustain, but maybe requires more power to boot. So let's go ahead and uh, let's see what happens if we uh, uh, unplug it and plug it back in. Okay, plug it back in. Let's see if we power. Nothing? Yeah, you got a light. I got a light. Oh, wow, that's weird. Huh. Oh, well, I didn't do it right. All right, so never mind. Disregard that test. Well, I don't know. Is the light green or is it amber? It's green, yeah. But it was amber. Right? It was amber, so it may not be getting enough power. I'll have to research the lights on the on the uh, Axis camera. It may, may it may not be getting enough power to actually go through its full boot sequence. We'll have to test that out th uh, more thoroughly. But notice, I'm able to adjust the power of these types of uh, devices pretty e e either. Um, yeah, uh, I, one of the guys just commented, and he's probably right. It's got enough to power the basic functions, like the LED and all that stuff, but probably doesn't have enough to actually go to the camera. Uh, so uh, I don't have a way to test that because I don't have my network extended to the table right now. But uh, I'll test that later. But I bet you it's got enough to power the LED and all that, but it doesn't have enough power to power the other functions, like the lens or the imager or anything like that. So you're probably right. So anyway, there you go. That's how you configure those devices. Uh, and also, we can put a schedule. So we can have our ports turn on or off based on a schedule. So if I don't need nighttime viewing or I don't need my cameras on on the weekend or I don't need my cameras on at particular times, I can shut them all down really quickly and really easily right through my managed POE device. So this is a beautiful thing. It's why it makes these cameras, uh, and why it makes this type of power management on POE so powerful. What a great selling point, too. You can convince your customer they're going to save uh, on power, which they will. And more importantly, they can shut the cameras down when not needed, which is great. They can manage them, have them come back on, come back off whenever you need to based on a schedule. You also can do your network management, SNP management, security management. You can manage UPS power. You can have this device. So, for example, let's say the battery level on the UPS starts to drop. This guy can detect it and it can lower the power consumption on the ports. This is great for like phones or for wireless access points. You can also set priorities. Like let's say, for example, I absolutely have to have my wireless access point functioning, but it's okay to kill the phones. Or it's okay to kill the cameras and the phones, but leave the access point running. I can set the access point port to be higher priority than I set the other ports. So that way, when the UPS power kicks on and the battery starts to drain, the UPS can send uh, uh, commands to this device, and I can actually have it start to shut down or lower the power on the non-critical ports. So that's really a powerful feature. And uh, so there you go. You got, you got those features. And I can view status uh, configuration. I can see a status of the ports with a nice little graphical interface, see what my voltages are, what my temperature is what types of PDs I'm using. Right now, you can see it's kind of telling me, based on green, what voltage, it, what, what wattage it's at. So you have all sorts of ability here to do this. In addition, just because power in our devices is so super critical sometimes, we don't have to power this just with AC power. We can have a backup secondary power source, which is a DC power source. So uh, Fred, go ahead and go pick up the device, and turn it around, and I want them to see the secondary power input. Flip it over. All the way over. Keep going. Just flip it. There you go. Right next to the, you see the little green connectors right there? You have a DC power connection for a secondary power support source, so you can power this thing up even if the primary source fails. All right, we're done with that. There you go. That's the 9524G, capable of all sorts of power. In addition, one thing I did not show you, which you may want to know about, 
Sometimes we have complicated PoE scenarios going on where we have incompatible PoE devices. We also have the ability to change what type of PoE each port is. So let's say it requires Cisco power over Ethernet. Because Cisco came up with PoE before anybody else did, and so they had their own proprietary PoE. So if you have people with different types and styles of PoE, you can configure the ports to output those. So this particular device is Cisco PoE compatible and uh, legacy PoE compatible as well. So we can configure the ports to output that particular type of power. All right, there you go. Let's go ahead and move on to extending PoE power. All right, Fred. We're going to show them the PD PoE extender. This is a great product. Uh, he's, uh, let me uh, bring up the live view here so you can see it. Fred's got it in his hand. This is the PoE extender product. This particular product, yep, yeah, you're right. This particular product extends PoE an additional 100 meters. And it does not require power at the end. So it only requires power at the source, right? So basically what happens is, uh, let's try it, Fred. Let's uh, plug, um, let's, go from, uh, let's go from our switch. Let's go from the PoE port here into the PoE in, like this. And let's go into here. And now I want you to plug this into here to prove that we have power. So we're going standard AF power out of our PoE switch. Fred is plugging it into the PoE extender on the in, not the out. Is that the out? Okay, there you go. And now plug that into the micro semi tester to verify we got PoE. There we go. So we got AF coming in, AF going out, right? So there you go. Pretty neat. Now, uh, you can also extend this an additional 100 meters and another 100, and another 100, and another 100. So it extends Ethernet and PoE, and you can go up to 500 meters by extending four of these together, right? So you can daisy chain four of these guys to go a total of 500 meters by connecting one after another, and it does not require DC power. Fred, flip that thing over and, and prove. It does not require any power source other than PoE in order to do this. See, no DC power source. Okay. Now, it does not need local power on either side, and uh, but, however, it does change the power. So let's talk about that. If you have four pair AT coming in, right, then you're only going to get 802.3, you're only going to get 25 watts, 25.5 watts at the other end. So 60 watts coming in, you're going to get 25 watts out the other end. If you have AT 30 watts coming in, you're going to get 12.95 AF coming out the other end. If you get 15.4 watts AF coming in one end, you're going to get 12.3 watts AF coming out the other end. So that's the only thing you need to be mindful of. Let's, let me show you that. So here we have, we're going to plug this into here. This is our AT source. This, is, this should be AT over two pairs, right? Actually, no, I don't want that. So this is AT over four pairs. And that's going to go into here. Now, tell us what the light says. So that we're going from high PoE, four pairs, 60 watts, into the extender, and then the extender is extending in another additional 100 meters, and we've got our micro semi tester on the other end, and we should see now what the power is. Do you see it? There you go, two, uh, three, over. Yeah, so it comes out 802.3 AF over data. So it, it came in AT, came out AF, and it's only over data pairs. So there you go. So it switches the power. That's something you need to think about. <clears throat> All right, very good. That's extending power over Ethernet. All right, I've got 10 minutes left. Uh, before I quit, let me go over some complicated stuff, stuff I'm not covering in the class. But here's some stuff you should think about. For those of you who are geeks and want to really dive in. <clears throat> so first off, PoE classification. PoE gets classified through an automated process. Uh, 
POE 18 has a two event classification process. Um, so there's layer one and layer two classification. We can either classify what type of POE we are on by a physical connection that happens, it's a pulse that happens between the two devices, or we can use a protocol to do it. The protocol method is using LLDP protocol to communicate between the two devices so the devices can tell each other what form of POE they want. It's kind of a raging debate right now is which is the best way to go. Also, you need to understand non-standard POE attempts, like this high power POE thing we've been talking about, which is pretty much standard now, but there's a lot of non-standard uh, attempts at POE. You need to understand that because that can impact device compatibility. Also, be very mindful. When you power things on initially, is different than delivering power to the entire cycle of the device. So if you've got a bunch of devices, just because your switch says it has enough output power doesn't mean it'll actually do it. So if I've got a whole, if I've got 24 devices in my 24 port switch, I may not have enough power to actually sustain the boot storm of all 24 of those devices hitting that switch. So it's another big impact you gotta think about. And also, a lot of devices requires to split the power. I did not show you a splitter today because I just don't have one, but uh, uh, splitting power is something you need to think about when, when going to the edge. Finally, I will wrap up with the PoE tester. Fred and I have been showing you the Micro Semi PoE tester. For the first 20 people who log on when you get the link from my team, uh, when you log on and you join and you take my PoE test, you will be have an opportunity to get a micro semi PoE tester sent to you free of charge. Uh, of course, this requires you to complete the test. <laughs> Actually, it'll be real, rather, rather easy. But this, this works with either mid span or end span, and it tells you AF, AK, two pair or four pair wiring, just like we did in class today. So there you go, that's pretty much it. Let me wrap up just by telling you what the, what's coming up. In two weeks, uh, next, uh, in, in two weeks from now on Thursday, I have PSU 303, which is my IP surveillance setup for outdoors. I'll be talking about outdoor enclosures, lighting, wireless, uh, and power issues. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that uh, in a couple of weeks. And also, I'm going to have some showcases, which are going to be hitting the PSU website and also my YouTube channel. I'm going to be showcasing different vendors for power supplies, PoE extenders, Ethernet extenders, extending to Ethernet uh, PoE over coax, and a few other power products. So I've got a lot of other power products to show. I only showed in this class Micro Semi and, um, and uh, uh, Minuteman, but I have some other products I'm going to show as well. So I'll be doing that over the next couple of weeks, so look forward to seeing that. Before I conclude, I want to ask if there's any questions before we conclude the session. All right, I'm waiting for questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording.